Hi everyone, uh, happy St. Patty's Day. It's Wednesday, March 17th, and I'm so happy to be here with you all. So today, I thought I was gonna take a little bit of a different spin on uh, these little Wednesday afternoon sessions. So number one, I've opened it up here to all of my Facebook community. So I hope that some of you will be joining me over the next couple of minutes. So if you're there, please feel free to post or comment any questions that you have. But today, I really wanted to focus on things that are related to uh, Irish descendants or Irish traits or Irish diseases or Irish fun facts. So number one, I love to celebrate St. Patty's. So I am Irish by origin. My great, great, great grandfather moved to Ireland in 1832 and he actually settled on the land which I now own. So I'm actually really happy for that. Um, so it's really great to know your, um, your roots and it really can say a lot about kind of who you are, where you've come from, but we also know that genetically it makes a big difference. Um, so I'll share a little bit more of those stories here with you today. So anyone else out there that's Irish, if you are, please comment. So I've been so fortunate to be able to uh, travel to Ireland many times. I love the country. I love the people. Um, there's just so many things from, you know, the green grass that we all think about to, of course, the pints of Guinness at the brewery, uh, to Jameson whiskey, um, to the Celtic music that you hear all across Ireland. You know, I really am in a happy place when I've been able to visit Ireland. But for today, I will be celebrating with uh, friends and family. And of course, where else do we celebrate Ireland, but we go out to a pub and we have a pint of Guinness. So that is my little Irish day celebration that I'll share with all of you. So I wanted to talk first though, about a few little things when we think of Ireland and when we think of St. Paddy's Day. So what's one of the first things that comes to your mind? Okay, Irish stew, okay? So I wanna take these little fun facts and see what the kind of history is behind them. So Irish stew, so growing up, we grew up on stew, meat, potatoes, carrot, turnip, all this kind of great uh, veggies and meats that were simmered for a very long length of time. And, you know, as a kid, I often thought that, you know, this was stew and it was really just a staple within our family. When I went to Ireland, I didn't even know at the time, actually, as a kid, that it was an Irish staple. But when I went to Ireland, there they called it Irish stew or stew. But I realized that this is, you know, it was from um, my great, great grandfathers that came through. And those traditions really uh, settled into the east coast of Canada, in particular, Miramichi, which is where I'm from, which actually hosts a really large Irish festival. Um, so Irish stew, is it healthy? Is it good for you? Well, guess what? So Irish stew is often, originally it was made from lamb. And again, it's lamb that's really slow cooked and simmered. Um, you know, at home in New Brunswick, we would typically make it from a beef stew. So basically you're taking some type of meat. Often these were the, um, the cuts of meat that were a little bit tough, so they had to simmer them for a long time in the pan. And then you're gonna add your veggies to it. So traditionally potatoes would be um, one of those key vegetables. And then turn up carrots and of course some onion. And then you add a little bit of spice. The spice uh, on the east coast of Canada basically consists well, maybe this is just a miramichi of salt and pepper. So that's what sp uh, spices were. You might get the occasional bay leaf that would be put in. So can Irish stew be healthy for you? I would like to say yes. So number one, when we look at what we're getting for our meat, if we can really try to get meat that is from grass-fed animals. So that's number one. And that's what Ireland is known for because it has you know, the type of climate where animals can graze outside almost 365 days of the year. So if you can use a grass-fed meat uh, as part of what you're using for Irish stew, so that would be number one. And then we look at, yes, the potatoes. Now I know the potato gets kind of a bad rap when it comes to nutrition. Uh, number one is that, yes, it's a high carb vegetable. For some people, white potatoes, uh, which contain nightshades can be an issue. So if you want to maybe healthify your Irish stew a little bit, then think of adding sweet potatoes to it. Okay, sweet potatoes are uh, a great root vegetable that has lots of nutrition, lots of micronutrients. And then you can add things as well like rutabaga or turnip. So turnip, you know, as a kid, I really didn't like this vegetable at all. 
I didn't like the flavor of it, but as an adult, it's actually, uh, I'd grown to be one of my really favorite vegetables to have. So you throw a little bit of uh, turnip into your Irish stew, and of course you wanna put some carrots in there. So you're gonna have a really colorful stew, adding in some onions for flavor, but also we know that onions are so amazingly good for us. And then you're gonna slow simmer that. We know that, especially if you're having any kind of tummy troubles, when we cook food over long periods of time, it actually kind of partially digests food down a little bit. So that can make it easier for our bodies to digest. So I would give Irish stew a winning version as to something that can be healthy within our modern uh, day and lifestyle. Okay, for me right now, and for many of you that are out there that are going low carb or keto, like I said, so basically up those veggies like turnip, you could even put in radishes instead of your potatoes. A radish when it's cooked actually tastes a lot like a potato without the starch. You can put those onions in, you can add lots of celery to it, but you'll still have that basis of an Irish stew. So that's number one, Irish. Okay, so number two, we'll have to talk about a little bit about meat and potatoes, okay? So meat and potatoes are truly a staple of Ireland, but they're also a staple of East Coast Canada. And is this healthy? I would like to say yes. How do we healthify it? By again, making that swap. So maybe taking that potato, um, instead of having just a regular white potato, making it a sweet potato. But you can get any cut of meat. And you know, so many times now, I think in our modern way of thinking, we think that food has to be difficult. People say to me, I don't know how to cook. <laughs> and I kind of think it doesn't have to be difficult at all. Number one, anyone could get a roast and put it in the oven. And this is what traditionally Irish folks had done, right? So they would get a roast, they would get a chicken, put it in the oven for two to three hours. And at the end, you have a really good meal because you're gonna have that slow roasted meat. It doesn't have to be complicated. You can put just salt and pepper on top of it. Um, and then when you think about your potatoes, so one of the things that Irish traditionally will do is do what's called a roasted potato. So now I have to kind of give away some of my goodies. So living here in Bermuda, I realized after meeting many Irish and British people, what a roasted potato really was. So what you do when you get a roasted potato is you actually first, you pre-boil your potatoes. Um, and so you're gonna get them ready to be in the oven. Then you drain those potatoes off. You actually want to evaporate the air from them or the water from them. So you're gonna put them in the pan and kind of cook them a little bit longer so the steam comes off so that you have a dry potato. Then in the oven, what's been happening is you have a little bit of oil. Now, traditionally the Irish, have been using duck fat, okay? Because duck fat has an amazing taste, it has amazing flavor. So they'll have that oil preheated in the oven and then they'll take those potatoes out that have been parboiled, they'll cut them up into big chunks and then they'll put that into the hot fat that's already been in the oven and then they'll cook that for about 30 to 40 minutes. So this is super, super delicious and super, super crispy because what happens is that duck fat gets into the outside of the potato and as you, you toss them every 15 to 20 minutes or so when they're cooking so that all of the sides get this really crispy coating to them. And it almost will taste at the end like a French fry, but it's not been fried. It's been wholesome potatoes that have been cooked in duck fat. Okay, so if you want a slightly healthier version of that, what you could do is to challenge yourself by doing the same with turnips, or you could also do it with radishes. Radishes, though, you'd have to peel them before because you need the outside of the skin. But if you want to do that, then you could have a, tr a traditional meal of roasted potatoes with some type of meat, which would be your meat and your potato version that you would get. Okay, so classic foods that we think of. The other one that we would think of for Irish foods is soda bread. So uh, classic soda bread is basically just made with flour. Uh, you have a few leavening agents, like a little bit of baking, uh, baking soda, a little bit of baking powder, and that's what you will have in traditional soda bread. So it really is a high starch based food, uh, but this was used traditionally in Ireland. And oftentimes, you know, when I think about Irish food and what made it and how, you know, many years ago, just like our grandfathers and my ancestors 
had lower rates of heart disease. It's because those um, individuals were often farmers and fishermen. They were working out in the fields. So we know that when we eat traditional foods and if we work in a job that's a traditional lifestyle, that those foods don't actually always have such an impact on our bodies. But what's happened with our modern lifestyle? Well, number one, we sit in offices. You know, I sit at a desk, I sit at a chair. Um, and this is the majority of the world how we're working now. We're not out harvesting, we're not hunter, hunters and gatherers. So those traditional ways of eating, like our meat and potatoes and that high starchy soda bread, that's probably gonna start to have health consequences for someone that's sedentary and sitting at their desk every day. So would there be healthier versions of Irish soda bread? Yes. We know that you can still have bread and enjoy it. We know that there are versions of bread that I've, I've talked about before. There's gluten-free versions. There's sourdough recipes that you can make that have less impact on our digestive system than some of the traditional grain-based breads. So that would be my soda bread comment. So what else do we have Irish? If you have any comments, please post them below about Irish food you want me to comment about. But I have to talk about Kerrygold butter. So why? Because Kerrygold butter is like one of the number one butters in the world. So it comes from basically grass raised cows uh, that are from Ireland. So you can find Kerrygold butter all across North America. It's actually though a little harder to get in Canada. Uh, what makes it great is number one, it has amazing butter fat content. So the taste of Kerrygold is honestly like no other butter that I have had. Uh, super delicious. Um, also the cows, like I said, they're grass fed cows and so much of the butter that we have now in North America is cows that have been grain fed. You know, so the, the fat that's going to come from a cow that was raised on grains is going to be different than the, cat, the, the fat that comes from a cow that's actually just raised on grass. So I would challenge yourselves to give yourself a try with Kerrygold uh, butter. Absolutely delicious. And if you're using it as part of a ketogenic lifestyle or, or you want to have a fun alternate, then it's a great thing to have. And I'll just have to put a little plug in there for butter overall. You know, I was trained as nutritionist. I still remember in, in my undergrad when they tried to tell me that certain types of margarines were much better than butter. But, you know, I never believed it. And one of the reasons why is because when I would have that margarine, it would basically melt on my toast. It would have no flavor, absolutely. And I would also say, how did they make margarine? Well, you know the way they make it is they basically get an oil which has been processed. Um, and then they take that oil and they produce, whip it essentially at super, super high temperatures to form it into a block. So many types of uh, oils, of sorry, of margarines, can some can have trans-based fats that are in them, which are not good for us. But I always said it was always about the flavor. And for me, life and health has always been about looking at my roots, looking at what was given to us on the planet, and then how we can take those foods to use them in a healthy way. So even back in undergrad and nutrition school at McGill, I said, no, I'm gonna eat butter. And I think for many of you, butter can really be a part of a healthy lifestyle. Uh, on a ketogenic diet, yes, individuals will be eating large amounts of butter. But for most people that I see, you know, if you're having butter on a slice of gluten-free bread, if you want to have butter on some of your broccoli, it's going to give you much greater uh, bang for your buck for flavor and for taste. So I would like you to reconsider butter and how maybe you can start to incorporate that in healthy amounts into your lifestyle. So what, what else does Ireland give us? You know, if any of you have visited, you know that Ireland uh, can have green fields and the green fields come with a lot of rain and also a lot of Ireland is very coastal. But what do we know about green fields? Well, think about green fields and what's a fun thing that you can do in the summertime when you're running through the green fields is to take your socks off and to run bare feet in the grass. So Ireland makes us think of this, you know, the green fields of Ireland. And what I want you to think about is getting yourself out there when you have green grass. Now in Bermuda, where I live, we can do that year round, but I know so many of you, my friends in Canada, aren't gonna be able to go out in the green grass. But when we actually go barefoot on the grass, it's actually good for our health. 
There's a concept now called earthing. So what earthing means is that when you walk barefoot on the soil of the earth, that the earth has a magnetic charge to it, believe it or not. The earth is a big rock, remember? We've got lava on the inside of our earth. But when we um, go barefoot on the grass or on the rocks, we actually can balance our own uh, charge out that's in our body, and that can actually be absorbed by the earth's energy. Now, I know this might sound a little strange to you that you've never seen it before, but there's actually a lot of research. There's studies that are uh, being done on what's called grounding or earthing. And when you think about it, most houses now will have some type of grounding for electrical outlets so it doesn't create some type of static. But that static, think of that static charge, those sorts of charges and ions can build up in our bodies as well. So when they've looked at it scientifically, what they saw is that they measure people's blood, essentially the, the thickness and the inflammatory markers in the blood. So when those individuals were exposed to grounding by walking on the grass for 30 minutes or just sitting on the grass uh, versus those that were not, they could actually see changes in the blood parameters from people that were outside and that had been exposed to the earth's surface. Yes, this is medicine, this is research, and remember that when you think of the green fields of Ireland. So I did want to talk just about a few points that come into, so I've spoken about Ireland and Irish food and, uh, you know, celebrating the green grass of Ireland, but there's a few diseases to think about if you are someone that has Irish-based inheritance or Irish roots. So one of the things that I think about most is a condition first called Dupuytren's contracture. So Dupuytren's actually, what it is, it's when people get a contracture of uh, the palm of their hand, when the fingers start to go, they start to become flexed, more like in a claw type position. So as a kid, I really didn't know what this condition was. All I know is that, you know, my grandmother had this problem and one of my great uncles had this problem. And then when I went to medical school, I realized that this is actually something that's more associated with an Irish inheritance. So it's something to think about if you're starting to get this condition. It is one of those genetic things that I'm not sure if there's a way that you can completely avoid it, but if you do have it early on, you can start doing exercises to kind of soften out the, the palm of your hand. Um, surgery is the ultimate option that sometimes can be necessary for individuals, though um, the condition can still come back again. But I thought that's pretty interesting that that's quite specifically, we see that in a lot of Irish roots. The other one that we see with Irish roots is rosacea. Now, we do know that, yes, Irish folks like to drink maybe a little bit. Um, and so often we think about Irish individuals of having red cheeks and, and rosy cheeks. It's not all the alcohol, okay? I want to say that, tell you that Irish inheritance are more likely uh, to have a condition called rosacea. So what's rosacea? You might have seen this before where people look really flushed across their cheeks and even the nose can get look really flushed. Uh, sometimes it can be called even adult acne because we don't generally see it with kids. And what it is, number one, from a genetic standpoint, uh, there are certain things if you are from Irish inheritance that you'll, um, the receptors on your skin, the types of bacteria that your skin produces, um, the types of sweat glands that you have are a little bit different that can make you more prone to getting that condition. But the other thing that uh, rosacea, beyond being Irish in roots, that we will sometimes see is if you have a gut microbiome that's out of order. So what does that mean? So basically, you've heard me talk about before about all the bacteria that live inside us. When those bacteria are not in order, they can actually cause inflammation in our body. And one of that ways the inflammation can be expressed is in our skin. So if you're getting rosacea or adult acne, then you need to think about the bacteria that are in your gut. But the other thing that you need to think about is the bacteria that actually live on our skin. So we actually have bacteria that are living all across our body, which is why some topical preparations for rosacea, one of the things that we use is a substance called metronidazole. Metronidazole is actually a, is an antibiotic called flagyl. Uh, and what it's doing, it can actually get rid of some of those 
bacteria that are living just on the surface of the skin and that in its own can be enough to settle down rosacea. And then the last condition that I wanted to talk about, which is of an Irish or Celtic origin, is a condition called hemochromatosis. So hemochromatosis is genetically inherited and it's when your body produces too much iron. So when this happens, uh, some individuals never know about it. Maybe they've gone in to see their physician and their hemoglobin level, which measures your overall iron in your blood, maybe it's up just a little bit. But a more specific test is to get a ferritin level, a ferritin measurement, or we can actually look at the gene to see if you have it for hemochromatosis. So why is it a problem? So number one, if you're making too much iron, then it's going to be stored in other areas of your body. So we know that people that have hemochromatosis have a higher risk of liver disease and liver cancer. They can also have a greater a tendency to have colon cancer as well. So what is the treatment for it? It's actually to go for blood transfusions on a regular basis. So basically, they'll take off that extra blood so that it's not going to go to other areas of your body to cause damage. But I bring it up because many times uh, I'll see patients that will come in and maybe they had a family member that had this iron storage problem and they really didn't know about it. But if you come from Celtic origin and you're having problems that your iron level is high, and you have it, then you should look to get your other family members tested for it as well. Hemochromatosis, and I'll write the name down in the, the notes below. So that is my little Irish spiel for today. So some fun facts about Ireland, some food facts, some um, health facts that we want to look out for. So I hope you found it interesting. I know there's been a few of you that have been on board. Um, and just before I leave today, I do want to put in a special invitation to all of you about the event that I'm having on Saturday. So this Saturday from 10 to 12, I'm going to be doing um, a spring equinox uh, planning. So this is a little ritual that I've developed for myself. I've been doing it for the past four years. So I get together at every quarter and I sit down and I look at where my life is and I look at what goals I want to have for my life. So in December, I was able to bring this to you through Zoom. And now I'm going to be able to bring it to you again through Zoom on Saturday. So if you're interested, I had posted the link uh, previously on my Facebook page. If you didn't see it, then please send me a message. It's free. It's fun. And this time we're going to take it a little bit further. We're going to start with a very gentle 30-minute uh, yoga class. Now, it's all on Zoom, okay, so you don't have to basically um, show anybody what you're doing. You can just do this in your own home. Uh, and then we're going to go into the exercise where we use crayons and pencils, and we just kind of draw this kind of wheel of life diagram out, and we start to kind of plot our goals and plan our goals. And then we're going to actually have another little breakaway session where my friend Lynn is going to lead us into um, a little bit of mindful movement and a little bit of a musical exercise. Again, you can turn your phones on mute. And then we'll finish up uh, with just a very, um, a very gentle meditation so that we can take all that goal planning that we have, that we can embed it into us, and we can make some action plans for going forward over the next couple of months. So I really hope that you'll join me on Saturday from 10 to 12 on Zoom. Message me if you need to get the link. So everybody, have a safe and happy St. Patty's Day wherever you are in the world. Take care and nice to see you all once again. Bye.